Hello everyone and welcome to my photo presentation of the evolution of Austin Healey interior trim. This evolution only includes what we know as the big Healeys, so not including the Sprite or any non-standard production models. To start off, I'm going to give a brief history of the big Healeys before I get into the interior trim details. In the early 1950s, there was a big gap in the market for both price and performance. On the low end, we had the MGT series cars, which were still using the same outdated body styling they had done since the 30s, whereas on the high end, Jaguar's race-winning XK120 was seemingly a bit too expensive for the average blue-collar worker to afford. Famous car builder Donald Healey sought to capitalize on this gap, and thus the Healey 100 was conceived to be a mid-price range sports car that would be capable of exceeding 100 miles an hour. Based on the Austin A90's mechanicals, it was originally developed by the Donald Healey Motor Company to be produced by his small factory in Warwick. The engineering design was mainly the work of Donald's son, Jeffrey Healey, and was mounted on a chassis designed by Barry Bilby, while Jerry Coker designed the sleek Italian-inspired body. The Healey 100 was introduced to the public on October 21, 1952, at the London Earls Court Motor Show. There, the car caught the attention of the world and impressed Leonard Lord of Austin Motor Company so much that he signed a deal with Donald Healey for large-scale production to begin at Austin's Longbridge factory the following spring, thereby changing the car's identity to the Austin Healey 100. This first series, known as the BN1, was equipped with a 90 horsepower 2660cc engine and a 3 speed manual transmission with overdrive on the top two gears. Healy's Warwick factory produced the first 19 examples of the car by hand in early 53, while Longbridge geared up for full scale production, which began that spring. Jensen were contracted to produce and paint the body shells. Freshly painted body shells would then be delivered from Jensen to the Longbridge factory for assembly. Soon, additional performance parts like the Le Mans modification kit started becoming available throughout 54, while advertisements of the kit started appearing in October of 55. Meanwhile, the Race Ready 100S model made its debut at Earl's Court in October of 54, and a limited run of 50 100Ss were produced at the Warwick factory throughout 55. The new BN2 model started production at Longbridge in August of 55 and debuted at the London Motor Show that fall, thereby replacing the BN1. The BN2 featured a stronger four-speed manual transmission with overdrive in the top two gears. Other features that distinguish the BN2 from the BN1 were slightly larger front wheel arches and a curved swage line on two-tone cars. After barely a year of production at 200 cars a week, the BN2 ended production in July of 56, thereby ending the 100 model as we know it. In August 1956, the redesigned 106 model began production at Longbridge and debuted to the public that fall at the London Motor Show. The 106 featured a 2-inch longer wheelbase than the 100, and most notably, a more powerful straight-six engine in place of the slightly larger inline 4. It also included two occasional rear seats for youngsters, making it a 2 plus 2. The body lines were slightly adjusted as well, with a shorter, wider, oval-shaped grille and an air scoop added to the front bonnet, as well as a fixed windscreen. The 106 used a tune version of BMC's C-Series engine previously fitted to the Austin Westminster, initially producing 102 horsepower. These Longbridge-built BN4s as we know them were initially built with a troublesome gallery head that didn't perform as well as expected. So, in late 57, an improved flow six-port head with separate intake manifold was introduced, increasing the power to 117 horsepower. At the same time, production of the 106 was being transferred from the Longbridge factory to the MG plant at Abington. The first 106 to be built at Abington rolled off the line November 20th of 57, while a week later the last BN4 rolled off the line in Longbridge. 
During this transition process over to Abington, the BN4 production slowed to a halt for much of early 1958 to make way for production of the new two-seat variation of the 106, otherwise known as the BN6, which was introduced that April. When the BN4 resumed production in September 58, there were several Abington trim changes that were implemented that carried on into the early 3000 models. Finally, the 106 model ended production in March of 59. Then, on July 1st of 59, the new Austin Healey 3000 was announced, featuring a larger 2.9 liter engine to replace the smaller 2.6 liter engine of the 106, as well as standard disc brakes for its front wheels. The wheelbase and body styles remained unchanged as a standard 2 plus 2 BT7 or a two-seater BN7. Towards the end of May 1961, 3000 Mark II was announced with triple SU HS4 carburetors and an improved camshaft. Other changes included a vertical barred front grille and an optional brake servo introduced in August of 61. In November of 61, both models were given an upgraded center shift gearbox and corresponding tunnel. Finally, the two-seat BN7 was discontinued in March of 62 and the 2 plus 2 BT7 also discontinued that June. T towards the end of August 1962, however, the 3000 Mark II Sports Convertible, otherwise known as the BJ7, was introduced. The BJ7 was a true convertible with a wraparound windshield, wind-up side windows, swiveling quarter lights, and a quick-action folding top. Larger twin SU carburetors replaced the triple SUs, and it was claimed the standard production car could exceed 115 miles an hour. Then, in February of 64, the 3000 Mark III sports convertible was introduced. With increased power from 136 to 150 horsepower, a new high-lift camshaft and larger SU carburetors. Power-assisted braking became standard instead of optional, and the car featured a new wood fascia dashboard with center console. The upholstery was now most commonly available in embossed AMLA vinyl instead of the traditional leather, although the plain leather still remained a rare option. In May of 1964, the Phase II version of the BJ8 was released, which gained better ground clearance through a modified rear chassis. In March of 65, the car received separate indicator lights, and finally, at the end of 1967, it was announced that the 3000 was ceased production altogether, thereby ending production of the Big Heelys as we know them. The first piece of material applied to all Healy cockpits was a layer of heavy tar paper along the upper firewalls and on the main floor pans. The tar paper acted mostly as a moisture barrier, but also sound and heat deadening. Following the tar paper was a layer of quarter inch jute material with a black moisture proof coating on one side. Jute was generally applied to the footwells, tunnel, and main floor pans to insulate against heat from the engine and exhaust. Most Healy's had some areas of the interior bodywork hand-painted to match the interior color. This would have been one of the first steps before any upholstery went in. On the 106 and 3000 models, the door aperture and inner door frame edges were painted, and on two-seat BN6 and 7 models, the battery door aperture was also hand-painted, as well as any corners or crevices around the rear edges of the rear quarter panels. This practice carried right through the convertible models as well. Continuing with the footwells, the sills and towboard carpets were glued in over the jute on the towboards, and the outer kick panels were screwed in place. On BN1s, the panels were made of 8-inch Baltic birch plywood, sanded to beveled edges and trimmed in leather cloth. The BN1s also featured a plastic identification plate mounted to the driver's side kick panel. This plate was changed to an aluminum identification plate in late 54 which was then moved to the firewall location in January of 55. 
With the BN2 model, the panels were shortened slightly to clear the relocated wiper motor and made instead of masonite hardboard trimmed in leather cloth. With the introduction of the 106 and 3000 models, the footwells changed slightly as the pedals were relocated to above and the right kick panel had a recess cut out of it to accommodate an inch or so of extra foot room on right-hand drive cars. This cutout was applied to all cars in right-hand or left-hand drive configuration. The footwells continued unchanged until the BJ8 model where the kick panels received some foam padding and were made taller to accommodate the new wood dash arrangement. The Healy 100s had a simple under dash parcel tray on the passenger side that was trimmed around the perimeter with vinyl and had a carpet insert on the shelf face. Later 106 and 3000 cars, up to and including the BJ7, had a slightly larger shelf that had a cutout for the washer fluid bottle, and the vinyl cover was sewn and covered the entire underside rather than just the perimeter. On early BN1s, the scuttle seal was a simple and fairly ineffective rectangular strip of rubber that stuffed into a channel welded on the scuttle. This changed in about mid-55 to a much better design of seal that attempted to actually trap and funnel the water out of the door opening. This new scuttle seal design remained standard right through to the convertible models when windscreen seals were incorporated into the existing scuttle seal design. The long bridge built cars all had a Furflex draft excluder along the inner front door posts. It was glued in behind the front kick panels up to the dash mounting and then switched sides and continued up to the top of the scuttle, being sandwiched by the windscreen posts. On Abingdon built cars, the fur flex was replaced by a fuzzy rubber extrusion door seal that pressed onto the bodywork around the entire door opening, finishing on top of the rear quarter panels respectively. This seal was held down along the top of the sill with an alloy inner sill cover. Early BN1s had a two-piece painted dash fascia. Depending on your color scheme, the center gauge cluster was often painted silver or body color, while the rest of the fascia was painted to complement the interior color, or match the body color. When the early adjustable steering wheel was changed to a non-adjustable steering wheel in December of 53, the steering wheel opening was filled in slightly. Then in early March of 54, the two-piece dash was replaced by a single-piece design. For a period of time, it seems the single-piece dashes were painted solid color with no contrasting gauge area, but eventually they did go back to having a contrasting colors. By mid to late 55, the raised gauge cluster started getting painted silver on most cars. On some BN2s, it's been rarely found, this section was sometimes even sprayed without masking. With the release of the 106 and 3000 Roadster cars, the dash fascia was redesigned to accommodate heater and windscreen washer controls. The fascia was now trimmed in matching vinyl instead of paint. The bottom edge was finished with clips on early BN4s, replaced by a metal finisher in mid-57, and finally a fuzzy snap-on finisher on Abingdon-built cars. The six-cylinder cars also had a separate padded wood dash top panel to fill in the space behind the fixed windscreen, trimmed in vinyl with piping on the edges. The demister vents were painted to match the interior color on the dash top. With the BJ7 and BJ8 convertibles, the dash top was changed to a deeper design with wraparound edges. Here you can see the slight difference in end profiles between the BJ7 and BJ8 dash tops. BJ7s were still color matched to the interior, while BJ8s were always black. The BJ8 also featured a completely redesigned wood fascia dash with a glove box and a vinyl covered center switch panel that fastened to a lower center console panel with optional radio and chrome speaker. Moving to the tunnels, the BN1 had a flat aluminum front bulkhead panel with a curved rubber seal riveted to the panel that sealed around the gearbox. The panel was then trimmed with jute and carpet and screwed in place. The first few hundred BN1s had a unique welded aluminum tunnel trimmed in carpet with vinyl edging. 
This tunnel was replaced by a sleeker aluminum pressing with a redesigned single piece of carpet glued to the tunnel with vinyl edges and covers. Then, in late 54, this tunnel was adjusted slightly with a hump pressing added to the back to better accommodate the overdrive centrifugal switch contents. This required the carpet pattern to be adjusted to a two-piece design with a dart sewn to accommodate the new hump. The BN1s also had a separate removable rear tunnel section that was trimmed in vinyl-edged carpet. This section mated to the rear fixed drive shaft tunnel that was covered in carpet. Then the two rear sections were covered by a 19 inch long padded center armrest snapped in place with leather pleats and squared vinyl sides that extended to the floor. The BN2 saw a redesigned steel tunnel to accommodate the new four speed side shift gearbox. It extended all the way back to the rear fixed tunnel section and was covered with a sewn carpet snapped in place with jute glued to the underside of the carpet. The front bulkhead was reshaped to wrap around the sides of the footwells. The rear fixed tunnel on BN2s was trimmed in armicord rather than carpet, and a slightly redesigned 15 and a half inch armrest was snapped in place with front sides that curved forward. The BN4 carried on from the BN2 and used the same tunnel carpet ending just past the rear edge of the steel cover. It differed slightly from the BN2 in that the fixed rear tunnel was covered in carpet instead of armicord. The armrest was the same as the BN2, but the longer four-seater layout meant that there was now a strip of carpet showing behind the rear armrest. Meanwhile, the next model was under development at Longbridge in the form of the BN6 two-seater. A factory photo of the BN6 prototype shows Longbridge-style seats, a vinyl spare wheel cover, and a unique armrest unlike anything we've seen before. In late 1957, a saddle type of armrest appeared with side flaps drastically shortened to two and a half inches, but still fastened to the tunnel and carpet with ten axes. It may have been a further development of the curious flapless prototype BN6 pad we saw in the prototype photo. This rare armrest was only seen on Lake Longbridge BN4s throughout late 57. During the hiatus where only the BN6 was being produced at Abington, the armrest design settled down to a much simpler, smaller armrest pad sewn directly to the tunnel carpet for both two- and four-seater cars built at Abington. These are often wrong in reproduction kits, because looking down, the original sides are not parallel, but taper slightly to the rear, like a keystone, and the pad is only three quarters of an inch thick. In November of 1961, the side shift gearbox and tunnels were replaced by the new center shift design that used a fiberglass tunnel section that incorporated the front bulkhead area as part of its shape. This was covered in a sewn carpet section that snapped in place and extended all the way to the rear heel board. The same keystone design armrest was sewn to the carpet, continuing on until the BJ-8. The Phase 1 BJ-8s had a long center console trimmed in vinyl with padded sides and polished finishings. Behind this was a short stowage box with a hinged padded armrest top. With the Phase 2, the console was shortened and the armrest extended with more padding in place of the storage box. Moving to the doors, the earliest BN1s, say the first few hundred cars, had birch plywood panels trimmed in leather cloth that had a piping strip tacked along the inner edge of the pocket opening. Like the rest of the wood panels, the edges were beveled by hand and the inner lower pocket had a brown suede-like material sewn to the outer leather cloth cover. The panels were finished with Furflex draft seals glued and tacked to the front and rear edges. In later 54, the panels started getting sewn through the wood panel around the pocket perimeter and this practice lasted right through to the end of Roadster production. The inner doors had leather cloth covers glued directly to the bodywork above the panel and below the swage line stiffener over the lower three quarters of the inner door skin. The upper inner area had a separately trimmed bitumen panel screwed in place. Then with the introduction of the BN4, 
the inner doors received a pair of overlapping inner panels that better finished the inner pocket compartment. There was also a third inner panel that was curved to a wedge in the bottoms of the doors to finish the bottom area. The main wood door panels had this pocket opening shape changed slightly and the inner lower liner was changed to vinyl instead of the suede material. This lasted until the BJ7 model, which saw the panel pocket shape change again with an inner pleated and trimmed aluminum panel housing the wind-up window mechanisms and a padded upper door rail with side window seals and rotating quarter vents. Finally, the BJ8 model advanced the door design again with a smoother, multi-piece, padded, vinyl-trimmed panel with chrome handles and winders and a padded upper armrest rail. Moving to the shut plates, all Heelys had these patterned aluminum door trim panels. They varied slightly in size and shape as the mark evolved. Early BN ones had these narrow door latches which were beefed up in mid-54 to a larger size that continued through Roadster production. Longbridge built cars all had an outer bead of piping that tried to match the car's exterior color, while all Abington built cars had black piping here regardless of the color. On Longbridge BN4s, they added these unique rubber door seals that fit into aluminum channels screwed to the door opening. As I mentioned earlier, the Abington built cars moved to a press-on fuzzy rubber door seal that was color matched to the interior. This seal would fill the whole door opening and finish off on the rear quarter panels respectively. The Austin Healey 100 rear quarter panels were a narrow birchwood panel trimmed in leather cloth, screwed over the edges of the rear wheel arch covers. It also overlapped the edge of the aluminum trim plates and had a flap that extended up under the cockpit rail. The top frame was mounted through the upper panels. The rear wheel arches were first covered with a jute pad that on early BN1s looked like this, then later changed to just covering the flat D-shaped surface to pad the top frame bars in lowered position. The wheel arch covers were sewn leather cloth with a bead of piping, glued in place and underlapping the surrounding arm accord and panels. With the Longbridge BN4, the rear wheel arches were first covered in a large sewn leather cloth cover, followed by a couple of trimmed birch plywood panels that screwed in place over and in front of the wheel arch. The large side panel was piped and had a front flap that glued under the front finisher panel, with aluminum finishings screwed on top. The area above the rear quarters housed the early BN4 top frame sliders where the top frame could be pushed to the back of the car for storage or slid forward for erecting the top. There was also a pair of pins for mounting the tonneau bar and a rubber catch on the left side to accommodate a hook on the top frame that would engage when folding the top frame up. In the rear corners, there were also these slender panels tucked under the rear shroud to fill the gap over the wheel arches. With the BN6 and BN7 two-seaters, the rear quarters and rear wheel arches received this intricate pair of panels, individually trimmed in leather cloth and screwed together, then screwed in place in the car. The top section of the panels had provisions for mounting the top frame, hard top, and for the door seal to finish. Another pair of panels extended back to the rear bulkhead to finish the rear sides. There was also a pair of curved seal straps trimmed in leather that held the top frame in its lowered position, with some corresponding small boxes trimmed in vinyl and mounted to the floor to hold the top frame ends. When BN4 production resumed at Abington after the release of the BN6, the rear quarters were changed to these larger birch ply panels with a curved steel top section riveted to the wood, trimmed in vinyl and then screwed in place in the car. The top sections had a carpet piece to finish it with provisions for the top frame, hard top, a tonneau bar, as well as a trimmed wood block for the door seal to finish on. The BJ7 convertibles saw these much bigger redesigned rear quarter panels in place to house the much larger quick folding top and frame. 
The panels were birch ply riveted to some front steel sections and trimmed in foam and vinyl to give them some padding. The tops of the wheel arches behind them were covered in carpet and the door seals finished on the upper sections of the front of the panels. The BJ-8s carried on in the same fashion as the BJ-7, however the padded vinyl covers were embossed with a square grid pattern and there were provisions for the rear fold-down shelf to lock in place and for optional seat belts. Phase 2 BJ-8s also had these lower bump box sections added for the improved adjustable rear springs. Moving to the rear cockpit areas, the Healy 100s and later two-seat roadsters were all trimmed in ribbed hardura, otherwise known as armicord. It was both insulating and hard-wearing and was hand-bound around the edges. Early VN1s had a large vinyl spare wheel bag that was found to be too baggy for the narrow factory Dunlop tires. So in mid-late 54, when all of the production changes were happening, especially to the interiors, this bag was narrowed to better fit the narrow factory tires. There was also a folding lid for accessing the twin 6-volt batteries with leather straps for snapping it down. The introduction of the BN4s saw the addition of rear seats, and so carpet was carried further back around the rear cushions, with vinyl covering the rear bulkhead behind the rear backrest. The rear cushions were these small steel tractor-style seats trimmed in a pleated vinyl cover and hand-stitched to the steel pans. The padding was minimal, and the heavy twine stitching was taped over on the underside for protection. The removable rear backrest assembly was a wood assembly trimmed with a pleated vinyl cover. The top section fit snugly against the rear cockpit rails in position and provided a space underneath for storing the Longbridge style top. Longbridge cars with their sliding folding top frame required a bit more room than the later Abingdon tops, so the top side section of the rear backrest was reduced in depth on later BN4s and BT7 cars. With the BN6 model, the rear cockpit area was again trimmed in Armacord Hardura with a similar battery access door as the 100s. The door surround and bulkhead edges were first trimmed in vinyl with hand-painted areas around the door opening to match the interior color. Earlier BN6s had a vinyl spare wheel bag with contrasting piping and a leather belt strap inside that passed through the inside of the bag and attached to a footman's loop on the top of the battery door. The early vinyl bag was quickly replaced with a more durable carpet-made bag that became the standard design for both BN6 and BN7. Back to the later Abington BN4s and BT7s, the rear seat cushions carried on in the same as the earlier BN4s did. The cushions screwed in place with trim screws and cup washers. With the more simplified top frames, the rear backrest top was reduced in depth by about an inch and a half, and the rear bulkhead area behind the backrest was no longer covered in vinyl, but instead had some carpet sections on either side to fill in the visible gaps around the backrest. With the convertible BJ7s, they introduced this taller wood backrest trimmed in vinyl with pleats on its face. It was hinged at the bottom so it could fold forward just enough to access the quick folding top. The backrest relied on some rubber catches in the back corners that it would snap into to hold its upright position. The rear bulkhead was now also covered in carpet that floated over the rear drip rail drain tube. The BJ8s saw several updates to the rear seating area. The cushion surround was now covered in a foam and vinyl covering with redesigned pleated covers and added foam to the cushions themselves. The cushions were now held in place with studs and nuts and washers that were accessible from underneath. The rear backrest was now this multi-sectional folding wood assembly trimmed in vinyl that could unfold into a carpeted parcel shelf with slide bolts that locked into the rear quarter panels to hold it in position. The upholstery was most often seen in embossed Ambla vinyl with plastic chrome piping, though you could also order it in plain leather with matching vinyl piping. Moving on now to the seats. The Longbridge style of seats were basically modeled after the Prototype 100, but tightened up in shape and quality. 
They were faced in Connolly leather with leather cloth vinyl for the backs, frames, and piping. Notably, the piping on the backrests followed the outer perimeter of the inner steel all the way around. They had wood tack strips along the lower backside with Hydem strips used to cover all the upholstery tacks. The pivot arms were actually individually hand stitched to finish them off. And the cushions were molded Dunla pillow cushions that had distinctive square relief cuts in the bottom. They were glued into some sloped wooden frame assemblies with cotton wadding used to level out the top and front of the cushions. The Connolly covers were glued in the center pleated section and hand tacked around the bottom of the wood frame. Early BN1s were even finished with white linen on the underside, hand tacked around the perimeter. But by the spring of 1954, the linen seems to have been discontinued and the wooden frame started getting painted black, often found with the letters BN chalked on. The Longbridge style seats lasted right through Longbridge production and into the early transition to Abington, loosely coinciding with the release of the BN6 in the spring of 58. The Healy's seats were redesigned completely and streamlined to get rid of all the wood components. The backrest covers were instead clipped along the bottom edge of the backrest steel, and the pivot arms were redesigned with pull-on sock covers instead of the hand stitching. The outer piping simply dipped down and ended just above the arms. The cushions were also streamlined with steel pans replacing the wood assemblies. Initially they appeared with a similar open bent cutout in the bottoms like the old wood frames had. This soon evolved to having a mesh screen added over the cutout, and eventually by the release of the 3000 Mark II, the steel pans became virtually solid bottoms with a few small holes instead of the big center cutout. The Connolly covers were again glued in the pleated sections and the, then clipped to the underside of the new steel pans. The corresponding lower seat frames also changed to a much shallower angle iron design as the new steel pans came into production. There have been cars found built during the Abington transition period that had the later backrests and cushions mounted to the earlier, taller Longbridge seat frames seemingly as they were using up old Longbridge stock. The streamlined Abingdon seat design continued right up to the BJ8, where everything was made slightly more luxurious. With embossed Ambla vinyl pleats, chrome piping, slightly more intricate seat cover pattern with more pleats and more foam padding, added to the backside of the standard padding to thicken them up. The new embossed vinyl with chrome piping was the new look for Austin Healey, but for the die-hard leather lovers, there was also a leather option available for special order, though the pleats were non-embossed and the piping was matching vinyl instead of the chrome. Rear backrests on BJ8s went from an embossed vinyl grid with chrome piping on vinyl cars to a 19-pleat pleat pleated panel with matching piping if you ordered the rare leather. Moving along to the Healy Tops, Healy tops were made of English Everflex vinyl, which had a similar look to leather cloth, but was waterproof and had a light grey backing. The Healy 100 tops were basically the same pattern for BN1 and BN2, based on an inner folding frame mounted to the rear cockpit that included the header rail as part of the folding frame. The inner side flaps that sealed around the side curtains had an aluminum tab sewn in the top front corners that could be bent to fit against the top corners of the side screen. The main differences in the tops included the outer chrome latches evolving from being riveted on the earliest cars to having screws with shallow nuts by late 53, and then finally the nuts were replaced with acorn nuts in late 54 right through the BN2s. The webbing straps changed slightly too in late 54, to being glued and screwed to the rear bow on the inside rather than the earlier screw through the top on early BN ones that would hold the top and trap the webbing to the rear bow. The inner header rail on early BN ones was trimmed in vinyl to match the interior color. However, from late 54 on, they were trimmed in matching Everflex with the top. The frames evolved slightly too, mostly in the lower mounting brackets and pivot area. Here you can see some photos of how that evolved from early to late, through 
mid to late 53 and late in 54. With the long bridge BN4 top, the frame was now mounted on sliders so it could be pushed back for storage. The inner webbing straps were now sewn to the top at the rear bow seam and was also secured to the bows and the header rail. The latches were slightly different from the BN1, BN2 in that the hooks were now flat and they were mounted on the inside of the header rail. When the BN4 resumed production at Abington after its brief hiatus for the BN6 production, we saw a second style of top frame that was now removable instead of mounted on the sliders. This second frame had distinctive angled main frame bars that pegged into sockets just behind the doors. The webbing on this style was no longer sewn into the top and was just attached to the rear bows and header rail. Then, shortly after the release of the 3000 Mark I, the frame changed again to a third style that lasted until the convertible models. This frame was notably straighter than the previous design, where it pegged into larger sockets slightly further back on the rear quarters than the ones used previously. The previous mounting sockets were retained, however, for hardtop mounting. This third style of top frame saw the webbing sewn into the rear seam of the top again, but the frame remained separate from the webbing. With the BN6 and BN7 two-seater models, the removable top frame had the header rail once again attached as part of the frame. It pegged into sockets on the rear quarters similar to the BT7 design. The webbing was secured to the rear bow and header rail, however it was not sewn to the top. There was also a distinctive webbing handle for pulling the rear bow into position. The front latches were quite different on these tops, and when being stowed, the frame was stored in an upright position just behind the seats. Finally, with the release of the sports convertible models, we saw a new quick-folding top frame in place. There were inner cant rails trimmed in off-white vinyl with grey woven window seals around the perimeter. The early BJ7s had a latching rear window assembly that was eventually changed to a better sealing zipper rear window that lasted through the BJ8s. The early BJ7 tops never had any side window drip channels. They were later added and made standard on later BJ7s and BJ8s. At the back, the top was mounted to an inner drip rail with drain tubes. Because these larger convertible tops were no longer invisible when folded down, they were given a standard boot cover to protect the top in its lowered position. The BJ7 boot covers were a slightly different pattern than the BJ8 ones, and had jute material sewn inside them to give them a rigid appearance. The front corners snapped to the rear quarters, and there were more snaps along the rear backrest and the body. The BJ8 style boot covers were slightly more sophisticated and used Armacord and Regalite plastic on the inside to create their rigid appearance. The front corners had snap straps with buttons along the rear backrest, with more 10x on the rear shroud. Moving now to the boot compartment, the Heelys were all trimmed in Armacord Hardura in the boot areas. Long bridge cars all had color matching Armacord in the boot interior, while Abington cars were done in black. On a number of original BN1s, it's been found that the inner shroud edge of the boot opening was sometimes hand painted black or bl dark blue on blue cars, though this practice doesn't seem to have been standard for all cars. Early BN1s had a narrower main gas tank cover than the later BN1s and BN2s. This pattern was different with longer side mats on either side to fill the gaps. The change to a larger full width mat happened in the late summer of 54 along with all the other trim changes happening at that time. Otherwise the 100 boot interiors were pretty standard. The spare wheel mounted on a shelf on the right side of the car with a belt strap and buckle securing in place. A small box section on the upper left housed the battery shutoff switch and was a good storage spot for smaller items. It should also be pointed out that the standard Model 100s all had their gas filler in the boot instead of outside the car. 
Healy 100s all came with an extensive toolkit in a pattern Rexine roll. There was also bags for the jack, jack handles, and side screens. With the introduction of the 106 BN4 model, we saw the rear bulkhead change with the introduction of rear seats. By removing the upper shelf space, the spare wheel was moved to the left side floor over the fuel tank. With a pair of vinyl trimmed wood blocks to wedge it against, and a redesigned belt strap and bracket to hold it in place. The new 12 volt battery and switch arrangement was moved to the right side of the boot compartment. The new style of jack was now strapped to the left inner bumper iron, and Longbridge cars saw the boot trim still color match to the interiors, however after the move to Abington the boots were always trimmed in black, regardless of the interior color. This black boot interior arrangement on four-seater cars remained virtually unchanged until the end of production. The only things that did change were the accessories and their respective bags. The two-seat BN6 and BN7 cars saw a redesigned boot compartment with the spare wheel mounted on a shelf above the axle and batteries like the 100, but now the wheel was centered instead of off to one side. The battery shutoff switch was on the bulkhead wall just left of the spare wheel. The side walls were all separately trimmed vinyl panels, and the plywood floor that covered the gas tank was now trimmed in armor cord with a lift-up compartment door on the left side for stowing the jack and tool kit. After the hundreds, the tool kits became much more sparse as years went on. The tool roll became a simplified bag with just a few roadside essentials included. As roadsters had plexiglass side screens, their stowage bags had an inner divider panel to protect them from scratches. There was also a bag for the tonneau covers, a bag for the tonneau bars, and a bag for the boot covers on convertible cars. Moving on to the tonneau covers, the early BN1 tonneaus were a smaller fit of tonneau. They followed the cockpit rails around the front and had 10x snaps in the front corners, as well as around the rear cockpit. There was also a separate little flap on a common sense or Murphy fastener just behind the doors so the tonneau could easily be folded and tucked behind the seats. Later BN1s and BN2s had a slightly larger pattern with more squared off front corners and Murphy fasteners instead of 10x used in the front corners. Here you can see an early BN1 tonneau in red being compared with a later BN1 and BN2 tonneau in green. All the Healy tonneaus had lightning brand zippers installed, usually with a tan colored material around the metal teeth, although later BJ8s saw this material in black. The 106 also carried on using Murphy fasteners in the front corners and just behind the doors. The four-seat Roadster tonneaus also employed a tonneau bar behind the seats that would help support the area over the rear seats. There were also inner frame pieces fit into pockets in the rear section of the tonneau to keep it flat. The BN6 and 7 models were similar again to the 100 tonneaus, but with a slightly different front curvature to better suit the dash top shape. It should be noted that with the convertible models, the tonneau cover was an optional extra, though the boot covers came as standard equipment. Convertible tonneaus switched to using lift-the-dot snaps along the dash top and door tops. The sides and rear sections were stiffened with jute sewn inside to form its taller profile needed to cover the larger convertible top. They also employed a tonneau bar for tidally supporting the rear section. Moving to the side screens, the earliest BN1s had solid Perspex side screens that sat in a polished aluminum L-shaped frame channel. These early screens made opening the doors difficult with the top up and were easily scratched. So in late November of 53, a second style of screen was introduced that were made of Everflex and Regalite materials and featured a lower signal flap that could be used for accessing the door latches. These flaps had a metal rod sewn inside and an inner strap with a 10x snap for securing the flap while driving. This inner metal rod evolved into a flat metal bar with a rivet installed to reinforce the inner strap. 
Then, in late 1954, we saw the screens change again to a simpler pattern, removing the separate flap in exchange for the lower rear half of the screen being liftable for access to the door latch, and a larger inner strap with tenax for securing the inside. With the introduction of the 106 models, we saw the Everflex and Regalite design replaced with a sliding plexiglass screen. Once again, there was differences between early Longbridge screens and the later Abington ones, most notably in the angle direction of the divide between the front and rear sections of the screens. The earliest 50 or so BN4s had a much narrower metal frame as well. Finally, I'll mention some of the optional hardtops. With the 100 models, there were no factory hardtop options, However, there was some prominent aftermarket ones available through the dealerships. Most notably was the Universal Laminations hardtop that was a plexiglass and wood inner structure and had a coarse vinyl covering with headliner and an inner dome light. These were available in dozens of color options, though black seems to have been the most common. The Universal Laminations hardtops also came with their own set of sliding plexiglass side screens that were similar to the later 106 style screens. Then, with the introduction of the 106 models, we saw factory standardized hardtops being made available through the dealers. These tops were made of fiberglass, with domed plexiglass rear windows and inner vinyl headliners. They were generally available in white, black, or body color. These factory tops changed and evolved slightly with the fitting of various body styles, including the later convertible models. Well, that about sums it up. Of course, I could expand further in any of these topic areas, but I hope you've enjoyed my presentation and have learned a few things along the way. Of course, all of the upholstery items discussed in this video are pieces that I've researched and patterned and can reproduce for anyone interested in accurate reproduction interior trim for your Austin Healey. Just contact me, Jeff Chrysler, a self-proclaimed detail enthusiast and the proud owner of Rightway Heritage Trimming. Thank you.